was just wondering, what is what would you consider to be the worst investment you've ever made? The worst investment I ever made? Mm -hmm. How long do you have? <laughs> I received an email a couple weeks back from you, and it said that if I forwarded it to 20 people, I'd get I'd get ten thousand dollars. I still haven't seen the money yet. My favorite was they offered to cover my legal costs for just dollars a month. Uh, <laughs> what do you think are some of the most important or most challenging societal issues that we face? I think the issues of equity. We got lucky tickets in life. We got a ticket said American. We got a ticket that said intelligent. What is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? What did I tell you that impressed you the most? <laughs> <laughs> the world's richest billionaires, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, give students advice on how to get a job how to find success, and how to help change the world. Coming next on Buffett and Gates Go Back to School. The two richest men in the world are dramatically different. Warren Buffett earned his $41 billion the old-fashioned way by investing in solid old-line companies that sell basic products, insurance, soft drinks, home improvement, and shoes. Bill Gates is the modern genius who earned his $50 billion by creating the world's largest software company, Microsoft. His innovative products include Windows, Office, and Xbox 360. In spite of their differences, the two men are close friends, and they share a common passion, interacting with America's brightest students. Today, Buffett has invited Gates to join him in a dialogue with students from the University of Nebraska School of Business Administration. Buffett earned his bachelor's degree here in 1950. There was a girl I had a big crush on, and she was paying no attention to me. She was going with some guy to play the ukulele, and I thought, it must be because of the ukulele, so I got a ukulele for her to play it, and she still ignored me. <laughs> Both men relish the opportunity to engage in spirited discussion with members of the next generation of business leaders. The one condition they placed on this event is that no faculty, staff, parents, or reporters will be allowed to talk. Only students will ask the questions. We're all pretty excited just to have the opportunity to meet with the two richest people in the world. There's a lot of questions. I've been waiting for this like all, uh, all week. I'm feeling pumped. I'm excited to see these people. Got it? Terrific. Well, this will be great. Please give a warm University of Nebraska Lincoln College of Business Administration welcome to Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. As the men take their seats, students selected by the faculty of the business college are ready with questions that have not been shared with either Buffett or Gates. The students end with one of the most difficult questions facing business today. Hello. Hi. My name is Kim Martin. I'm a senior finance major here at the university. My question is, how do you instill ethical leadership throughout your organization? And to begin with, how do you know that the management, one level below you, is making decisions that would parallel your own? We have all the money we need. You know, we'd like to have more, but we can afford to lose money. But we can't afford to lose reputation, not a shred of reputation. And therefore, I ask the managers, I ask them to judge every action they take, not just by uh, legal standards, although obviously that's the first test, but also by the test, what I call the newspaper test. How would they feel about any given action if they knew it was to be written up the next day in their local paper, to be read by their family, by their friends, by their neighbors, written by a smart but kind of unfriendly reporter? And if it passes that test, it's okay. And I tell them if anything is close to the lines, it's out. And uh, they can always call me if they wanted to check something. But if they call me, there's something wrong with it probably anyway. So, and that's about it. In Microsoft's case, uh, our top uh, management team, uh, the majority of them uh, joined us as right after uh, whatever degree they got, if any. Now, our business in, in many ways is kind of simple. It's about writing, writing great software. Uh, we sit down every year to go through the various things that uh, people have to be careful about. We have products that have 
high market share. We do business all over the world. So there's some particular dictates, how you work with suppliers, gifts they might uh, come forward with. But it's, it's mainly the uh, seeing these people in action that, that make us confident about their behavior. I should mention that, that I'm, I am the only college grad up here. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll be taking my Harvard shirt off pretty soon because I, I didn't complete the whole course, no, they, so I didn't think I should leave it on the whole well, time. Well, they don't allow you to wear it more than half the day, as I understand it, actually. Hi, I'm Tara Steinbach. I'm also a senior finance major at the university. And this is for Mr. Gates. Um, since you joined the board at Berkshire Hathaway, have you considered possibly taking over for Mr. Buffett when he retires? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to take notes on this one. If you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this uh, this being on the Berkshire board is a real honor uh, for me, and and uh, I just uh, joined the board last December. I have to say it's not uh, very remunerative. Um, I can't couldn't even make the flight out here on my uh, uh, Berkshire director's fee. Uh, <laughs> I didn't I didn't hear that part. <laughs> uh, but, in, but Berkshire's been organized in a very unique way uh, and, uh, of course, very different uh, from my business experience, which is all really related to software and what goes on there. So I'm looking forward to being a good advisor, uh, making sure that Berkshire's grooming people uh, for whatever succession eventually has to take place. But uh, it won't be me. Uh, Berkshire's got a lot of great people, and uh, uh, they, they understand the unique system there, and I'll, I'll step uh, step up to it. We pay, we pay our board, uh, our directors, $900 a year, and I really would like to pay them more, but the bill's so far ahead of me on that Forbes list already, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't want to give them any ammunition. <laughs> and uh, seriously, we're very, very lucky. I mean, there, were, there are people that would pay anything to have Bill on their board, and it's a real act of friendship uh, that he has come on the Berkshire board. It, it takes a lot of time. If the rewards are there, they're only psychic. But it's it, to have him there, you know, with the small difference in our ages, uh, makes me feel very good. Uh, I'm the older, actually. I just explain it. Uh, the, it. It makes me feel very good to know that uh, I've got people of uh, uh, both of the quality and the, the, the experience and everything else to make that decision when I'm not there the next morning. So I'm, I'm very grateful. Okay. Thank you. Here it comes. Yeah. He's got it. Bring out his high school. I'm Brian Poppy. I'm a junior actuarial science major. Uh, my question for you is, how did you two meet the first time? Is there like some sort of billionaires conference that I don't know about? Or? Yeah, we have these things. We don't talk about them. <laughs> no, I, I met Bill in, on July 5th, 1991. And uh, I was out in uh, Washington uh, uh, as a guest of a, a, f a friend of uh, mine who uh, uh, was an editorial page editor of the Washington Post, and, and she knew Bill's parents and uh, said, we're going down to this place uh, on the Hood Canal that, to meet the, the senior Gateses. And, 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 uh, Bill may show up, and uh, I'll let Bill take it from there. <laughs> well, it was, it was a funny event because uh, my, my mom was very sociable and always, you know, getting people together. And uh, I, at this time, didn't believe in vacations. You know, I was totally focused on my job. And so when she said to me, you've got to come out and uh, meet, it was uh, Warren and Catherine Graham and a couple other people, I said, Mom, I'm busy. Uh, and, you know, and she said, no, this will be great. And I thought, well, I'm not sure. You know, I'm, I'm into the software thing, and I don't know much about investing. Uh, and I hadn't, hadn't thought about it much. But I went out, and so Warren and I met. And uh, I'd actually come out in a helicopter. I was planning to go back a few hours later. Uh, but then by the end of the day, I was there you know, just talking with Warren. And so it uh, began a you know, really unbelievable friendship for me. And, you know, I could tell that even though we came from different directions, the kinds of things that fascinated us and that we thought were important were, were very much the same. And so 
you know, for the last 14 years, we found every excuse possible to uh, get together, whether it's, you know, bridge or golf. But uh, really, it's about talking about the world and thinking about uh, what's going on in it that, that's at the core of it. The, the moral of that is listen to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mark Schmitz, uh, I'm a senior actuarial science major. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your work, typical workday and how you manage your time to, a lot for like playing Halo 2 and that kind of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't get to play much Halo 2. Uh, I have to say, when I play with my colleagues at work, I get slaughtered so fast it's unbelievable uh, when I'm on a Xbox Live. Project Gotham Racing, I'm a little better at. It's nice to have a job where gaming is. Uh, uh, a serious pursuit, and we get to uh, think about that and talk That's what about he says. that. <laughs> uh, you know, and playing around with the latest technology, whether it's uh, you know new PCs, looking at new software, sitting down with researchers. Uh, it's it's why I think my job is the best. Warren thinks his is the best, but I'm I'm yeah. sure I'm right. Uh, anyway, I, I'm in meetings a lot. My calendar gets very full with those, and then at night. After the kids have gone to bed, I'm on email a great deal. I get, get messages during the day. That's my chance to give long responses. And then over the weekend, I, I uh, send a lot of mail as well, as well. I take two weeks a year to just go off and read and think, where I'm not interrupted by work or anything else. I'm just uh, solidly trying to think about the future. And people get to send me things to read as part of that so-called uh, think week. So it's a nice mix of things. About 25% of the time that I'm out, uh, traveling around, meeting with customers, Europe, uh, Asia, and that sort of helps me think, okay, do we have the right priorities? What, what are people responding well to and what would they, they like to see us do better? I'm on Think Week about 50 weeks a year. I, I, I work about two. And uh, you'd be surprised at, at, at my days. I mean, they are, they're very unstructured, uh, no meetings. Uh, none. I mean, we don't, I don't like meetings. Uh, and uh, I read a lot. Uh, I wish I were a faster reader. I, you know, I'd get more done. But I, I, but I do read a lot. And I, I, uh, I'm on the phone a moderate amount. Uh, uh, our businesses run themselves, basically, out there. My job is allocating capital, and, and I, that's what I'm thinking about. Uh, but I don't like to have things all packed hour to hour to hour. And, and Bill and I are both extraordinarily lucky. I mean, we really get to do what we like to do, the way we want to do it, with people that we choose to be around and that are terrific. I mean, we, we've really got everything uh, our way, and it's, it, it, we're very fortunate. And in his world, he has, some, he has a different kind of pace than I have. But we both love it the way we do it. And, and uh, uh, my guess is that we're each the most productive in that particular mode, too, because it, 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 it fits our personalities and, and, and aptitudes. My name is Telfer Voorhees. I'm a senior finance major. My question is, uh, after the Xbox 360, where do you see video games going? <laughs> <laughs> well, Xbox 360 is a pretty good step. Uh, uh, it's sort of the first of a generation of what we call high-definition games, where the, the realistic uh, vision that you get is, is almost like uh, reality. The other big thing is we want gaming to be more social. So this idea of live where your friends can get on and you can have spectators and contests and uh, make it into a, a very social activity. But we think we can draw in people uh, who are older, people who are younger, uh, more women into it by having a more variety of these game types. Now, every four or five years, there'll be a new game. So after Xbox 360, I don't know what we'll call it, you know, 720 or uh, something uh, uh, obvious like that. It, you don't have to go out much further until the visual realism is so good that it's like uh, trying to improve a CD audio. Uh, you know, there, there are ways of encoding audio with more resolution than a compact disc but people can't tell the difference. So a lot of it will come back to the creativity of those game developers. We will start to have cameras and speech recognition, so you'll be able to talk to the game instead of just using uh, the triggers. You'll be able to take you know, a bat or a golf club, and our camera will watch uh, what you're doing. And so it'll be a bit more like a virtual reality thing in terms of uh, reacting, and then it, it seeing exactly how to respond to that.
Hi, my name is Pamela Bracey. I'm a senior marketing major here at the university. And uh, if you guys decided to drop a $100 bill, would you bother going back to pick it up, or would you let a lowly college student like myself go get it? <laughs> If he drops 10 cents on the floor as he walks out and he doesn't pick it up, I'll pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates give world-class advice to the students about good habits, making mistakes, and keeping their inner scorecard in check. Hi, my name is Nicole Brockhoft, and I am a senior business administration major here at the university. And I was just wondering, what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given, and how has it impacted your personal or professional lives? What did I tell you that impressed you the most? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I can answer that. Uh, when first time I met Warren, uh, we were talking about getting together and doing uh, something again, and he pulled out his calendar, and the pages were so blank. Uh, and I said, wow, you know, you've managed to avoid getting tied in to a lot of kind of meaningless activity. And you know, Warren said, yeah, you have to be good at saying no uh, and picking the things that, that really make a difference. And that's one of many things I've learned from Warren, but that's one of my favorites. And uh, I, so I can blame it on him whenever I'm uh, turning things down. Yeah, well, I, actually, I, I told him that was it. The, the truth is I don't get invited any place. <laughs> I think that, you know, I, I got an awful lot of good advice from my dad, and, and he, didn't, he didn't lay it on me. I mean, he just, you know, it, you, you, you picked it up from him, but there, there was never any of this, you know, do this, do that uh, type of thing at all. But, but I, I think he really taught me that it's more important uh, in terms of what's on your inner scorecard than your outer scorecard. I mean, some people get in a position where they, they're thinking all of the time of what what the world's going to think of this or that instead of what they themselves think about. And if, you, if, if your inner scorecard, if you're, if you're comfortable with that, uh, I think you're going, to, you're going to have a pretty happy life. And I think the people that strive too much for the outer scorecard uh, sometimes find that it's a little hollow when they get all through. Um, I'm Mary Reiser. I'm an accounting major. I'd like to know, we all consider you to be the financial business experts, and we look to you and follow your lead. But when you need advice and feedback about an idea or decision, I'd like to know, who do you go to? Well, usually I look in the mirror. I mean, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. <laughs> the nature of what I do means I have to think pretty much independently. Uh, because if I take a poll, in effect, I'm going to do what everybody else is doing, and I don't think much of that usually in investments. And so I have to have an environment, I and mean, I have to have a temperament personally that lets me think for myself. And I've got a terrific partner, a fellow named Charlie Munger. And you, you can't find anybody any smarter, any, any better quality of anything. But we think a lot alike, and we do talk things over occasionally, but we don't talk them over very often because. I know how he thinks, he knows how I think. He's taught, he's taught me a lot, you know, and, and you know, why should I pay for a phone call if I know what he's gonna say? <laughs> so, if I need to get a, a cabinet around to make decisions or anything like that, I probably shouldn't be running the place. At, uh, at, 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 and uh, that doesn't bother me to have the responsibility for it, but I, I, I just don't wanna put it up to a vote, because I've seen too many, particularly in the investment world, as you get larger and larger groups making the decisions, they get more and more homogenized. And I don't think you will ever get brilliant investment decisions out of a large committee. Yeah, for me, probably the most important decisions I make are a lot like when I pick what technologies uh, the company's going to bet on. Those are a bit like Warren's, where you really have to be willing to uh, be contrary, to leave some things aside and to go into some places that aren't, aren't very hot. If you get out of sight of that technical realm, uh, you know, I. I'm super lucky. I have Steve Ballmer, uh, who's now CEO of Microsoft, and we're in each other's offices almost every day. He, uh, you know, he's more of a business type thinker. I'm more of a technology type thinker. But we a little bit have learned uh, what the other one's going to say uh, o over the years, so we can give each other a hard time about uh, the positions we we expect. Outside 
of that, if I had some really tough decision, uh, I'd talk to my dad, I'd talk to Warren, uh, I'd talk to my wife, Melinda. Uh, so I, I have enough people that know me and actually know where my uh, judgment isn't its strongest, where I might get overexcited about something or you know, forget to think about something. And so they're good at correcting, particularly Melinda, good at correcting uh, whatever uh, those blind spots are. And, and I think it's good to encourage sure. your friends and advisors uh, to really give them that license. You know, I, I can go to a party and forget to say hello to various people or something. That's a very minor example of my blind spots. Not but. to the hostess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Melinda would help me do yeah, that. Yeah, she so, would, so. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, a, a small number of people that you can turn to on, on certain key things is a, a great, great asset. And incidentally, it at Berkshire, Bill has an integrated business. We have this diverse group uh, out there. But we have 40 managers, and I, I really encourage them to be doing the same thing. I mean, they, they run their businesses, and they know how to do it, and they're going to make some mistakes, but they basically make the calls, and they don't have to check with us. It's, it's amazing how decentralized uh, we are in that respect. But, but, you know, we bet on brains, and we bet on people with energy and brains and integrity, and... and, and they're going to call most of them right, and I think we would lose an awful lot by having all kinds of layers of committees to review that they had to check with and that sort of thing. I'm Caitlin Poulter. I'm an actuarial science major, and I'm a junior. And you both have several managers working under you, so I was wondering what are some steps that a new entrant into the job market can take to accelerate their journey towards an upper-level management position? Yeah, well, one thing I will tell you that I didn't realize when I was getting out of school is how much the unusual person will jump out at you. I mean, you know, and, and it isn't because they got 200 IQs or anything like that. It, it's really because of just how they behave, you know, what they bring, the energy they bring, the commitment they bring, the quality of how they do things, how they treat the people around them, all kinds of things. But you will jump out much more than you might anticipate. One of the things you would want to be sure to do uh, is whether you like it or not, get very comfortable, it may take a while, with public speaking, for example. I mean, that, that's a, an asset that will last you 50 or 60 years, and it's a liability if you don't like doing it and are uncomfortable doing it, that also will last you 50 or 60 years, and it's a necessary skill. But a lot of the skills are just human skills. If you get the best out of people around you, that's a rare talent, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't correlate with IQ. It correlates with a, you know, an attitude and a, toward the world and toward other people, and it's a talent that if you work at early, and you're really conscious about it. You know, you don't have to show up other people. You know, you don't have to be smarter than they are or anything else. You want to bring out the best in them. It will pay huge dividends. Certainly in the, the business Microsoft is in, the opportunity of, of an employee after they've been with the company, even, say, three years, People can start to rise. They can rise because they are good at strategy, uh, and that's mostly writing things. They can rise because they're leaders of people. Uh, they can rise because they're an individual contributor. And we try to have career paths that are good for each of those things. What, the ideal person, to be frank, is somebody who's good at all three of those things. And as you get high up in the organization, the jobs really demand uh, great individual thinking skills, being great with people and great with strategy. It's always stunning to me, given how many smart people there are, and in these individual buckets, there's, uh, there are quite a few people. But when you want that combination, it's rare. And I don't know why it is. It's possibly if you're a good individual contributor that you're given so much slack that you're never encouraged to reach out to other people and get their ideas. But the, the people who have that right combination or if, they, if they're not good at one of those things, they partner up with someone and draw uh, that missing piece out. Those are very rare. So whenever we're looking at top spots, uh, you know, if we could find more people like, like that, we'd, it'd be a fantastic thing. Uh, my name is Ryan Menlik. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I'm a senior accounting major. And uh, my question, Mr. Gates, is I received an email a couple weeks back from you, and it said that if I forwarded it to 20 people, I'd get, I'd get $10,000. <laughs> I still haven't seen the money yet. How do you think you got to be number one on that list? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I get a lot of that spam email myself. Uh, 
Uh, my favorite was they offered to cover my legal costs for just dollars a month. Uh, <laughs> so I'm trying to track those people down. No, but in all seriousness, um, when, when you were just beginning your career, what, what sort of things do you think were, uh, made a big impact in your success? What habits did you develop? And kind of what, what sort of things could you pass on to us as younger people? I had one habit that uh, I developed when I, when I was uh, at college that was actually a very bad habit, which was I like to show people that I didn't do any work uh, and that I didn't go to classes and I didn't care. And then at the very last minute, uh, like two days before the test, I'd, I'd get serious about it. And, and people, people thought that was funny. Uh, you know, that was my positioning, the guy who did nothing <laughs> until the last minute. Then when I went into business, that was a really bad habit. Uh, <laughs> and it took me a couple of years to get over that. Nobody praised me because I, I would do things at the last minute and, and I tried to reverse. Uh, to students I'd actually, uh, I didn't think that highly of who were always organized and had things done on time. I'm, I'm still working on it, but uh, uh, procrastination is not a good, good habit. Bill can change clothes in the car. I mean, I, I, <laughs> that's why we don't insure him, insure him at Geico, incidentally. But <laughs> he, he has a little of that habit left. Uh, so, but the habits you develop, and, and, and I go back to the other thing, is have the right heroes. I mean, I, I've always been lucky in that respect. And if, if the, you know, if, if you, the people you look up to, are going to form your vision of what the world, you know, how you want to be in later life. And the one, well, I'll give you two pieces of advice. I'd invest as much in myself as you can. I mean, you're, you're your own biggest asset by far. I mean, you've got, you've got all kinds of potential, all the people in this room, you, you know, you're lucky to be in this country, gotten a good education, but most people go through life using up a very, very small part of their potential. And so anything you do that invests in yourself, uh, is, that's the best investment you can possibly make. And then I would, I would follow my passion. I mean, whatever turns you on. You know, I, uh, uh, I found, I was lucky, I found something early that, that turned me on. But, but uh, you don't want to take a job just for the money. You don't want to take a job for an organization that you really don't feel good about or work for people that you don't feel good about. You, you really want to be excited when you get out of bed every morning. And it won't necessarily be the job that you have 10 years later, but you'll be learning so much as you go along. And, you know, I, I took a job with Ben Graham, my hero, and, and it, you know, I, I never asked the salary, and I found at the end of the month when I got my first paycheck what I was earning because I just knew it was the right thing to be, to be doing. So I would, I would, I would follow, follow your passion. My name is Elizabeth Vineyard. I'm a senior marketing major. I guess my question is, hearing about the globalization of business, being a small business owner myself, I wonder how you see that affect in the small business sector. I don't think... Most small businesses, as I think of them, I don't think it's going to have that much effect on what you do. I mean, if you're bringing something to your customer that they want at a price that makes sense for them, you know, you're not going to be undercut by whether somebody's doing something in China or India on a small business. I mean, if I, when I think of the small businesses I deal with, they do not have a, a problem with, with globalization. It, uh, if you've got a major textile business or shoe business or uh, you know, furniture business, you're going to be very much affected by what's going on around the world in terms of production costs. So. Yeah, globalization is important to track because it's changing the rules of the game. As Warren said, it doesn't directly affect a small business because usually the fact that you're there locally doing a very differentiated product means that somebody far away can't do exactly what you do. The biggest change agent in globalization is the, uh, what's going on in China, where they are, in a sense, even more capitalistic than we are uh, in terms of how they're, they're letting businesses develop and keeping things very efficient. And so I think it's very important, no matter what career everybody here is going into, to look at China as a change agent, think about globalization, and then think about uh, these indirect effects on the opportunities for the, the companies you, you work for. I think that will be very important. Hi, I'm Marissa Pond. I'm a senior management major. Um, obviously, as a public, what we hear most about are your successful investing in ventures or the new products that you develop that work out. I was just wondering, what, is, what would you consider to be the worst investment you've ever made? The worst investment I ever made? Mm -hmm. How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, I, I've, I've made some very bad ones, but that doesn't really bother me. I, uh, you know, it uh, may bother the shareholders, but that's another question. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you know, you're going to make you're going to make mistakes in life. I mean, it, there's no question about it. You don't want to make them on the big decisions. You know, who you marry and so, some things like that. So there's no way I'm going to make a lot of business and investment decisions without making some mistakes. I may try to minimize them. I, I don't I don't dwell on them at all. I don't I don't look back. Uh, the biggest mistakes are the ones that actually don't show up. They're the mistakes of omission rather than commission. We've never lost that much money on any one investment. Uh, uh, but it's the things that I knew enough to do that I didn't do. We have, we have missed profits of as much as, you know, maybe $10 billion in things that I knew enough to do and I didn't do. Now, the fact that I didn't buy Microsoft way back uh, is not a foregone opportunity because I didn't know enough to make that decision. But there have been other investments where I did know enough to make the decision, and for one reason or another, I either didn't do it at all, or I did it on a small scale. I was sucking my thumb when I should have been writing checks, you know, basically. And, <laughs> and, and you know, those don't show up. You know, there's no place where it, it shows missed opportunities. But I've, I've missed some big ones. The triumphs in life are, are partly triumphs because you know that everything isn't going to be a triumph. And, and, and uh, I, I would never get too hung up on mistakes. I know a lot of people that really agonize over them, and, and it, it, it just isn't worth it. I mean, tomorrow's another day, and you live it forward, and just go on to the next thing. I think in, in Microsoft's case, the biggest mistake uh, is where we miss uh, something that's coming along is going to be huge. And for us, if we get in too early, like uh, uh, the idea of delivering uh, TV over the internet, IPTV, we got in probably five years before we needed to. It's just now starting to happen. I don't, I don't feel uh, bad about that at all. There's a few things like understanding uh, direction, say the internet search would go, uh, where we go, ooh, uh, uh, we're playing a tiny bit of catch up on that. Uh, uh, let's, you know, let's work some overtime on this uh, little problem here. Uh, people are kind of underestimating uh, our ability to uh, move to the front of the pack there. And we've had that in many cases. Uh, we had that when the internet came along and became this big phenomena that we needed to really uh, push the company into that. We had that when IBM broke off its relationship with us and went into competition with us. That was a, uh, a very big challenge. But we don't want to have anything that comes along, some breakthrough in terms of how software is done, that we haven't gotten the best people in and are, are putting that together with the work we're doing. So it'd be missing uh, something like that, that that would be our worst mistake. Hi, my name is Morel Wax, and I'm a freshman international business major. How much money, as you guys being both billionaires, do you guys carry in your wallet at any given time? How much we got in our wallet? <laughs> well, I can answer that because we're going to go to a, this evening we're going to get in a poker game. Okay. And it's a $500 buy-in. So I made very sure that I had a five, at least $500 in my wallet. Uh, uh, and I, I have a little more than that, but I, I don't carry around a lot of money, Bill. <laughs> No, actually, a lot of times, uh, it's weird, I don't carry a wallet at all. I do what I do carry is bridge problems, so that if, <laughs> if I get in, in a line or uh, things are slower, even when I'm driving, uh, <laughs> I uh, like to have something to, uh, mental to work on. He better uh, have $500 tonight, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I brought a little extra, so uh, I'm, I'm ready for the game. As the event nears its end, students ask questions about how they can change the world. And Warren Buffett and Bill Gates offer surprising insight into the true nature of success. Hi. Hi. My name is Stephanie Tompkins. I'm a senior economics major. A lot of us are pursuing higher education because we want to leave the world a better place than the one we found it. And um, as one person at the end of the day who can actually affect <laughs> tremendous amounts of people and ideas. How do you make your decisions? You're, you're changing the world every day. I mean, if, you, if it's nothing but the children you have, I mean, you, you know, you are forming their view of the world and, every, and you do it every day. So you, you are a teacher. But with the people around you, one of the best things in life to do is to surround yourself with high grade people because you will behave as the people around you do, but they in turn are getting it from you. It's kind of like a planetary system. and and you will, I, I promise you, 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 know, you will change the world in some way, and, and my guess is you'll change it very much for the better. And, 
And you, but you can't expect to see something dramatic. I mean, it's not, it's not one of those Shazam move, you know, <laughs> uh, moments or something of the sort. But you, you by how you're behaving, are, are affecting other people, setting an example for other people. And you, you will find ways to, to, to leave a better world than you entered. And one thought I'd have on that is that I, I think it's very important, as young as possible, to get a broad exposure uh, in this country to people who are, are less successful in the kind of conditions they're living in and what kinds of things are holding them back. You know, is education working to uh, tap into people's talents and giving them the, the equal opportunity we believe in? And then ideally to get uh, uh, in many places in the world where living conditions aren't nearly uh, what they are uh, here in the United States. It's one of these things when you first learn all of this, it's a little easy to be down because you think, geez, I didn't know it was like that. Things are improving, and the opportunity for capable people to jump in, uh, whether it's helping with medicines, helping with education, a uh, small number of people can actually make a, a very dramatic difference. Hello, I'm Daniel DiLoretto from Reno, Nevada. My question is, our society, or our generation, Generation Y, we face a lot of issues. What do you think are some of the most important or most challenging societal issues that we face, and what can we do as future leaders to ensure that we create a better society in the future? I think the issues of equity uh, that we have, uh, whether it's between countries or even within our country, are pretty serious issues. And if you get too far out of whack on that, then uh, you get a divide and, and you don't get the fluidity and the sense of opportunity that this country is, has stood for. So I think you know, we've really got to renew our commitment to the ideals around uh, equality, and I, I think there are, uh, there's a lot of actions that that suggests we should be taking to invest in the long term that certainly at this stage we're, we're not taking right now. I, I, I can't say it better than Bill, but we, we got lucky tickets in life. I mean, you know got a ticket that said American, we got a ticket that said intelligent, we got a ticket you know, that, that said that this time rather than 200 years ago when the same talents <laughs> would not have produced much. So we got a very lucky ticket in life. A lot of people don't get lucky tickets. You know, we were over in China together 10 years ago and we saw some people that wouldn't make any difference what, what their brain power was or anything else, they weren't going to have a chance, uh, at least for a long, long time. I think we've got to do a much better job not only taking care of the people that get the bad tickets in this country, but in doing what Bill and Melinda have done, which is going around the world and, and helping those people have things that we regard as absolute, you know, givens in our society. I mean, uh, Bill has taken vaccines to people around the world that, that die at very young ages and families that get destroyed and all kinds of things for things that we could do something about. Those are the things that we should be working on in, in your generation. Hello, um, I'm Jared Carlson, uh, senior management major. Uh, my question is, if you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? <laughs> one superpower? <laughs> Bill, uh, well, I, you, you I, think more about that than I do. <laughs> uh, I don't know, extending, extending one's lifetime would be a, yeah. a reasonable thing. Yeah. yeah, I'll take notes if you have anything to say. <laughs> about that. Uh, you know, I don't. I don't think being able to get rid of competitors that wouldn't no. be much fun. That'd be like hitting a hole in one all the time. No. Uh, being able to read super fast, yeah, that'd be read, nice. That'd be huge. That'd be huge. <laughs> well, Bill can read. So, I mean, he, he reads about three times as fast. And just think of, I mean, he. he I probably wasted ten years reading slowly. But, uh, well, <laughs> no, if you if you you're talking about granting a wish, I mean, what you would with the type of thing. I mean, what you really would hope is that somehow you could reduce uh, the threat posed by nuclear knowledge uh, in the world. I mean, that is, that's going to be the great problem of mankind in your lifetime. And, you know, the, the knowledge is out of the bottle. The genie's out of the bottle on that. And you have a lot of evil people in the world. And then the question is, how do you prevent intent of evil people coupled with knowledge, which has now gotten more widespread, to interact in a way where huge amounts of damage are done to people throughout the world. And that's, I mean, that, if I could, I think that's the most intelligent thing 
to work on philanthropically, for example, but I don't know how to do it very well. I, I, we do a little, but that's, uh, you know, that would be the wish. But the reason, it's, the reason it's just kind of a dream is because the problem is so tough. Hi, my name is Kristen Lovegrove. I'm a senior finance major. In our society that's so material, and you and your families are so well off, how do you ensure that your children value things that aren't material and things that will truly make them happy in the end? Well, I was, I was a little lucky in that respect in that my kids didn't think I was rich. Uh, <laughs> and I wasn't rich for a while. I mean, but, but even, even after I was, you know, we lived in the same house. That they only, there's only one house they've known in their life in terms of a primary home. And they went to public schools in, in Omaha. And, and, and we lived in a neighborhood where, and we still do, where the, where the average income is probably more or less average for, for Omaha. So they, they really didn't have that problem. My kids didn't even know what I did. I mean, because I, uh, uh, probably because I couldn't explain it very well. But they did not grow up in a rich environment. Now, now uh, those situations different, and, and and just in terms of, of you know, being a celebrity and all of that sort of thing. And that that came late enough with me that it didn't didn't really pose pose problems for the family. But it it has to be a. It's a significant factor, and I'll, I'll turn over to Bill. Yeah, I can, I can verify what Warren said about his house. Uh, <laughs> I was very excited to go visit, you know, think, what has he done? What, what uh, amazing things is he going to have? And I went into his uh, dining room. He didn't even have seats on the chairs. Uh, no. <laughs> and he didn't yeah. even know they were missing either. So no, well, he, yeah. I, I don't... I don't <laughs> There's no hurry on these things, Bill. I, mean. <laughs> I think it is tough, and perhaps... Uh, particularly so when children grow up and have a you know, very nice house and they think, uh, you know, what are the real limitations? I do think there's some very basic things around uh, giving them an allowance at a young age and sticking to that and having them decide, okay, you want to buy a candy bar today, that means you can't buy uh, one in, in the future and start to figure out that, that there are real limits. I, I do think we're lucky that uh, our children will get to go uh, to Africa and Asia and see how people live and, and, and even from a young age understand that the United States is in ter statistically an aberration, that the lifestyles we have, we should wish that uh, many decades in the future that the world at large uh, can live in these same ways and you know, hope that people treat them in a normal way and treat them for what they're uh, actually good at. That you know, would bother me a lot if they were being approached uh, because somebody thought they could influence something. Uh, you know, it's an awful thing. Every kid should be evaluated based on, on who they are and, and what they're doing. Our kids are rich and are going to be rich by the standards of the world. They're not, they don't think they're going to inherit uh, a, a significant portion of the fortunes of either of us. I mean, 99 percent of what I have of, well, it'll go to philanthropy one way or another, and, and, and Bill has the same attitude, uh, basically, uh, that, that, that we are not going to turn out some super wealthy, super, super wealthy kids. They'll, they'll be wealthy. I mean, there's no question about that. And that uh, but the idea of dynastic fortunes, you know, I find it, it turns me off. I, mean, it, uh, I don't think it's what America is about. I don't think if you talk about equality of opportunity in this country and really having everybody with talents having a fair shot at getting the brass ring and all of that, the idea that you, that you hand huge positions in society on simply because someone came from the right womb, you know, I find that, uh, I just think it's almost un-American. Uh, my name is Matthew Bodie. I'm a senior from Elgin, Nebraska. Several Eastern European countries have successfully enacted a flat income tax. And now there is growing pressure uh, in Western Europe to do the same. Would you support the United States adopting a flat income tax, and why or why not? Well, I, I wouldn't support it. I, I, you'd be amazed how flat it is already. Uh, if you look at both the payroll tax, which is over 12 percent now, and that applies on the first 80 or 90 thousand dollars of income. So Bill and I pay practically none of that in relation to our income. The people that work for us, it's a big, big uh, tax. So if you take the tax that my assistant or, or uh, you know, the, anybody in our office pays, they've got 12% on that first 80 or $90,000, and then they have the income tax. And their tax rate 
literally, in many cases, is not, well, it's, it's, it's the same and maybe even higher than my own tax rate since they cut the rate on capital gains to 15% and dividends to 15%. So what has gone on in this country in the last, well, in very recent years, is a huge benefit to the very rich and, and not that much relief to people down below. And people, when you read about tax rates, they usually leave out the payroll tax and they don't, they don't refer to this 12 and a fraction percent. So we have come, in my view, to a taxation system that's much too flat in this country. And, and frankly, I think that, that, that Bill and I should have a higher tax rate on the income we get. We, we pay a lot of taxes, but, but uh, it's, it's really at, a, at a, a very low rate. And it's a rate that's less than half the tax rate that I was paying 25 years ago when I was making a lot less money. But, uh, they have really taken care of the rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I go along uh, with that wholeheartedly. I think uh, we probably need a, a more progressive system as we look to balance uh, the budget that at some point I think uh, people recognize that needs to be done. Probably one of the ways that will be done is, is that the rich should bear us a slightly, a somewhat higher proportion of the burden than they do to today. Very large fortunes aren't, never go through an income tax. Maybe it's a little ironic, but both Warren and I would say things in, in several aspects of the tax system should be uh, more progressive. I could spend the rest of my life, and I could have done this 20 years ago, and actually pay no federal income tax because I could have taken my Berkshire Hathaway stock, borrowed some money against it, every year to live on, and when I died, you know, then the estate would, would pay off the debt on it. But I, I could have gone through my life, a good bit of my life, without paying any income tax whatsoever. And, and it's, I, I frankly think it's, it's very unfair. Hi, my name is Dan Semft. I'm a senior finance major. My question is, the Forbes 400 puts your collective net worth at $91 billion. By comparison, that figure exceeds the combined gross domestic product of the bottom 70 nations in the world. How do you feel that your immense wealth uh, contributes to the balance of global prosperity? Yeah, well, the wealth, in effect, is a bunch of, I mean, the, the, the prosperity comes about through the products that Microsoft turns out. I mean, that, they're changing the lives of millions and millions of people. In the process, you get these eventual claim checks on society's output. These little pieces of paper that I've got in a vault called stock certificates you know, can be turned in at some point to, to get goods and services of one sort or another. Basically, the money is going to go in a way that we think will have the most impact, beneficial impact on society, viewed on a global basis, not just on a national or regional basis. It will go we hope, as intelligently as we can make it go, to change the lives of people all over the world. Now, there's two factors that enter into it. That's the amount you leave or put into charity and, and then how efficiently you do it. Bill and Melinda, in my view, they run the largest one, but I would say they also, certainly among all the big ones there anybody that I know about, they run the most efficient one. They have literally said to themselves, how do we use this money to change in a major way for the better the lives of the most people in the world. What could be more rational? So they've combined what I would call head and heart with huge sums of money, and no one's gotten a result, in my view, like they have. Yeah, I think the key point here is that owning, you know, Warren owns a, a big piece of Berkshire, I own uh, still a measurable piece of Microsoft. That's not consumption. Uh, what the limited resource of society uh, come up, you hit those limits as you consume. And so somebody who makes, say, 50 million and chooses to, you know, just build mansions and have uh, things happen for them, they are diverting resources in their direction instead of those resources being used, uh, say, to help out people who are less successful. And so, in fact, if you can accumulate some of society's wealth through luck and skill and then make sure it's used on behalf that the consumption overwhelmingly goes to the less fortunate. Uh, you know, it's a little bit like Robin Hood. You're recycling wealth from that top part uh, back, and it's incumbent on the people, uh, the higher up that list you are, the more, uh, in a sense, there's a responsibility to put not only the wealth, but your brain power into those activities. 
I am Allison Mack, a senior marketing major. As college students, we're constantly thinking and planning towards the future. Where do you personally envision yourself to be in 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't ask my doctor. <laughs> I'll be, uh, if, if I'm in decent health, I'll be doing exactly what I'm doing now because I'm doing what I love now. I mean, if, if I could do almost anything that doesn't require any athletic or mental ability. Uh, and, 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 <laughs> I, what do I choose to do? I choose to jump out of bed every morning and run down and work at, at Berkshire Hathaway. And I don't see anything that changes that. I'm doing what I love. And, and uh, you know, health will determine uh, how long I can keep doing it. But uh, I've told my children that when I start going gaga and, you know, spend my time spinning yo-yos and things like that, <laughs> that they're to come to me and, uh, and tell me that it's, it's time to step down. But I've told them they better all come as a group because if just one comes, I'm going to take them out of the will. I mean, <laughs> You know, ten, 10 years from now, I'll uh, be turning 60. Uh, I have to say, every, every time the, the, the age 10 years older than me always seems like that's when I'll be old. Uh, when I was 40, I thought 50 uh, would be that mark. Now that I'm uh, very close to that, I think, no, 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 that's, that's not uh, being old. You know, my life's work in terms of creating a company is, is certainly uh, around Microsoft. Over the next 10 years, my balance between the time I spend on uh, philanthropic things versus uh, my, my full-time job. We'll switch somewhat in the favor of doing uh, philanthropy, spending more time on that. It does mean I need to get uh, uh, one of the great young people at Microsoft to sort of get on the hot seat of setting the product strategy, which is the, uh, a great part of my job. I love my job. It's an amazing job. Uh, and uh, you know, I'll always be able to, to have some mix of Microsoft and then, then a bit more philanthropy. Hello, my name is Paul Turnus. I'm a senior business administration and music major uh, from North Dakota originally. Uh, I was wondering, what is your definition of success, and what has been your largest non-business success in life? Well, we played ping pong against a nine-year-old girl in San Francisco. <laughs> Two weeks ago, her name's Ariel. Yeah, how many points did you get? She got up. <laughs> Bill got more points off her than I did. <laughs> I thought I was pretty good. Too. <laughs> and this little nine-year-old, she's disgusting. She should have been in bed. <laughs> she totally cleaned us. Uh, and, uh, uh, no, that was, that was a little humiliating. Uh, I'd, I'd say in my case, my, my goal for uh, success out, outside of work is, is definitely raising a family. Um, just getting started with that. And I think there's some unique challenges of uh, when a parent is very visible and uh, has money and things like that. It's not easy in any case to uh, raise kids the right way. Uh, but I'd say I, you know, I, I hope, hope to be successful at that. Uh, so far, I haven't caused cause them any damage. They seem to be doing OK. We get a lot of people that want us to adopt them. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> He's working on his children, I'm working on my great-grandchildren, but otherwise we've got the same approach. <laughs> I would say this in terms of success, this will surprise you, but I would say I've never known anybody that got to my age or close to my age that had lots of people that loved them that felt anything other than a success. I mean, you have lived a successful life if, as you get older, the people that you hope love you do. And that, that includes your, your family, your business associates, all, all kinds of people. And, I, and the converse of that is that I know people enormously wealthy, you know, they get schools named after them and they get, they get uh, you know, they get uh, dinners in their honor, all that sort of thing. And the truth is that nobody thinks a thing of them. And I, got, I have to believe they know that and that everything gets quite hollow in their life at that point. And they, they've got all these markers. And there's people on the Forbes 400 you know, that, that are in that category. And uh, I won't name names. <laughs> they, uh, uh, but it's, I really, I, I can't think of anyone I've known. And, and I've known some, uh, you know, a lot of people by this point, point in my life. I, 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 I've seen them in very ordinary jobs, all, all kinds of situations. If the people around them love them, they feel very successful. <laughs> Thank both of you so much. We appreciate you coming. With the final question of the evening answered, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates prepare to leave the stage. 
but not before shaking hands with all of the students who took part in the event. Thank you for the Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, you're terrific. Yeah. Good. You're all okay. good. Thanks for coming. The bridge is a great game. I advise all of you to take it up. There's no game like it. If you go on the uh, internet, however, my name on there is T-Bone. And, <laughs> and Bill's name is Challenger, but he spells it C-H-A-L-N-E-N-E-N-G-R. Right. Yeah, that's not right. 